thanks to all the people who've organized it since I'm at the end, speaking for uh, the guests. Uh, there is a handout. Um, it, it's mostly just quotations, but I hope it might help um, bring out uh, the structure in my paper such as it is. Right? It's not super structured. So, a uh, quick first section. I'm going to talk about what Anscombe, in her book Intention, calls practical knowledge. Or at one point she calls it the knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions. She doesn't explicitly describe practical knowledge as a case of self-consciousness. But I think putting her topic in that context, as my title does, Self-Consciousness in Acting, helps to make sense of what she says. And so, helps us to understand the very idea of our agency. Uh, but before I bring in self-consciousness, it'll come in gradually as I go along, I'm going to spend some time, this is going to be pretty much all of it, working through what Anscombe says about knowledge of one's own intentional actions. That's one of the specifications that she gives of the topic. And now I'm on to section two. The first thing she says is that such knowledge is not observational. She gets to that, um, I'll explain quickly how. She singles out intentional actions by whether the question why, in a certain sense, has application. Why are you doing that? Right, whether the question is admitted by that person to whom it's addressed. The relevant sense of the question why is one in which the question asks for someone's reason for doing something. But in Anscombe's project, that account of the question, of the relevant sense, is off limits. That account of the sense of the question would presuppose that we understand the idea of reasons for acting. And that idea is part of the conceptual region that she's aiming to elucidate. So, she explains this relevant sense of the question why, which is going to explain the very idea of <coughs> intentional actions, in a roundabout way, which includes listing kinds of case in which the question doesn't apply. And one way of rejecting the question is to say, I knew I was doing that, but only because I observed it. Right? So, um, why are you walking in that peculiar way? I knew I was doing that, but only because I noticed that I was limping or whatever. That's a way of rejecting the question why, so it's a way of disqualifying uh, the, the action that's inquired about from counting as an intentional action. And it falls out of that, that knowledge of one's own actions is not observational. Right? If, if one's only knowledge of something one is doing is observational, then the question why doesn't apply. Okay, now to section three, which is slightly more complicated. Second play about knowledge of one's own intentional actions. It's not just not observational, it's not contemplative. Explanation of what contemplative means is actually in quotation four on the handout under three, but I'll, I'll give it to you. Contemplative knowledge owes its being knowledge to the independent actuality of what is known. If you think about it, observational knowledge is contemplative in that sense. It owes its being knowledge to the independent actuality of what is observed to be the case. But not all contemplative knowledge is observational. Uh, knowledge that you have because someone tells you something is contemplative. It's knowledge because uh, what you're told is independently so. So, denying that practical knowledge is observational, as in the first claim, leaves it open that it might be contemplative in some other way. And Anscombe argues that that isn't so. She arrives at that by a train of thought that starts with a sceptical question about that first claim, the claim that knowledge of one's own intentional actions is not observational, or as she sometimes puts it, without 
observation. She asks, this is the first quotation under three, is it reasonable to say one knows without observation that one is painting a wall yellow? That's an example. Why are you painting that wall yellow? Because that's the color my wife wanted it to be. That's going to be a case of accepting the question why. But is it reasonable to say one knows without observation that one is doing that? And she responds, this is the long quotation item two under three on the handout. I'll read it out. When knowledge or opinion are present concerning what is the case and what can happen, say Z, if one does certain things, say A, B, C, then it's possible to have the intention of doing Z in doing A, B, C. Think of applying that to the case, right? slapping, um, dipping the brush into the thing and slapping it on the wall like that. That's A, B, C. Uh, painting the wall yellow, that's Z. Uh, back to the quotation. And if the case is one of knowledge, that is this knowledge or opinion concerning what is the case and what can happen, if the case is one of knowledge or if the opinion is correct, then doing or causing Z is an intentional action. And it's not by observation that one knows one's doing Z. There she's just reaffirming the first claim. But now the interesting bit. Or, insofar as one is observing, inferring, etc., that Z is actually taking place, one's knowledge is not the knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions. By the knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions, I mean the knowledge that one denies having. If when asked, for instance, why are you ringing that bell? One replies, good heavens, I didn't know I was ringing it. You have to think of a case where somebody is standing on a switch that rings a bell but doesn't know that that's what's causing this noise, right? Good heavens, I didn't know I was ringing it. Now, the claim that, there, that knowledge of one's own intentional actions is without observation, that's the first of Hanscom's claims, might have seemed to imply that there's no room for observational knowledge when one's doing something like painting a wall yellow. And the question, right, item one in this section of the handout, expressed a surely well-placed skepticism about that. The person who's painting the wall yellow surely does have, typically anyway, observational knowledge. But here she's conceding in the bit that starts, or in so far as one is observing, she's conceding that someone who is doing Z, painting a wall yellow in her case, may be observing that Z is actually taking place. And in that case, that's going to be that the wall is actually becoming yellower than it was. It's just that insofar as the person who's painting the wall does have observational knowledge of what's happening to the wall, that knowledge is not the knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions. And now the question becomes, how can this concession that the painter may have observational knowledge of the relevant happening on the surface of the wall, cohere with claiming that that happening is also an object for some non-observational knowledge that he has as the agent who's intentionally effecting that happening, bringing it about. Uh, as she puts this question, this is three under three, the little Roman three under Arabic three, if there are two ways of knowing here, one of which I call knowledge of one's intentional action, and the other of which I call knowledge by observation of what takes place, then must there not be two objects of knowledge? How can one speak of two different knowledges of exactly the same thing? She goes on to talk about a, a, um, a way that that difficulty accounts for a temptation to conceive the object of an agent's practical knowledge as an inner item, separate from any observable happening. She dismisses such conceptions as nonsense. The idea is they make it unintelligible how a public happening can be the execution of an intention. But this uh, problem about how there can be two knowledges of the same thing generates a temptation to fall into that nonsense. 
And then she suggests that the source of this trouble is a failure to realize that knowledge of a happening as the execution of one's intention isn't contemplative. And now this is the final quotation under three on the handout. Again, long quotation, and I'll read it. Can it be that there's something that modern philosophy has blankly misunderstood? Namely, what ancient and medieval philosophers meant by practical knowledge. Certainly, in modern philosophy, we have an irreducibly contemplative conception of knowledge. Knowledge must be something that's judged as such by being in accord with the facts. That's the explanation that I paraphrased. The facts, reality, are prior and dictate what is to be said if it's knowledge. And this, that is, this being stuck with the contemplative conception, this is the explanation of the utter darkness in which we found ourselves. For if there are two knowledges, one by observation, the other in intention, then it looks as if there must be two objects of knowledge. But if one says the objects are the same, one looks hopelessly for the different mode of contemplative knowledge in acting, as if there were a very queer and special sort of seeing eye in the middle of the acting. A little bit of a gloss on that. Recall how Anscombe explains the knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions. It's the knowledge that one denies having if when asked, for instance, why are you ringing that bell, one replies, good heavens, I didn't know I was ringing it. Now, imagine a case that's like that one she imagines, except we're dealing with a person who has the knowledge that the person in her case denies having. So, there's a happening consisting in a bell's ringing, which the person knows through hearing it, so observationally, right? the sound is loud in the room. And that same happening, the bell's ringing, is also known to the person, not observationally, as her doing. Anscombe's point is that if contemplative knowledge is the only category at our disposal for placing that second bit of knowledge, then we're stuck with this obviously hopeless picture, a very queer and special sort of seeing eye in the middle of the acting. Okay, now I get to uh, section four, if you're following on the handout. At this point, having, having um, said the thing that she says in the long last quotation under three, she says, we need to understand practical reasoning before we can understand practical knowledge. I mean, we've started to understand it, but before we can finish, we need to understand practical reasoning. And she embarks on a discussion of Aristotle on practical syllogisms. The discussion is long, it's complex, but for my purposes, it's enough to bring out the essentials. I think this will do. The conclusion of a practical syllogism is acting in a certain way, not coming to accept a proposition. There's a premise that specifies something that, when the syllogism issues in an action, is revealed as an end, for the sake of which the agent is acting right in the action that's the conclusion. And another premise, or maybe a set of premises, in the light of which the action that is the conclusion is revealed as a means to, or maybe a way of, pursuing that end. That's highly schematic, but I think that will do as a representation of how Anscombe understands Aristotle on practical syllogisms. And then she makes some points. It would be absurd to suppose that there is practical syllogizing whenever there is intentional action. Um, let, me, let me see if I've got this on the hand up. Yeah, um, quotation under four. The interest of the account is that it describes an order which is there whenever actions are done with intentions. Right? That is an order which is there even when there isn't any syllogizing, but whenever there's intentional action. And she notices that the order that emerges from Aristotle's discussion of practical reasoning, practical syllogizing, is identical with an order that she described earlier in the book in terms of a succession of questions why, 
and answers to them. Uh, her example, and this will be kind of familiar to you if you know the book, but it, it's a lovely example for reflecting about. Why are you moving your arm up and down? Response. In order to work the pump. Or it could be because I'm pumping. Why are you pumping? The why question gets asked again. Response, in order to replenish the water supply in the house. Or, because I am replenishing the water supply in the house. And then the why question could be asked again, and it goes on for a bit. So that's Anscombe's order, um, and she's noticed that it's the same order as the order that Aristotle's treatment of practical syllogisms reveals. And there's a point to all of this. The topic of intentional action can seem like an unmanageable multiplicity. Uh, but this order, indifferently Aristotle's or Anscombe's, makes it manageable. Um, this seems to be something I don't have on the handout, but here's a quotation. Aristotle's practical reasoning, or my order of questions why, can be looked at as a device which reveals the order that there is in this chaos. So it isn't really chaos, because here's this order that we can uh, impose on it and thereby uh, see it as orderly. It, uh, the, the, the mass of different kinds of intentional actions that there might be. So that's what we needed before we could understand practical knowledge, and at that, po at, at, at that point she returns to the topic of practical knowledge. When she comes back to the topic of practical knowledge, she exploits that order, the order that emerged from her discussion of practical reasoning, to explain what she calls a form of description of events. That's a part of the quotation that's there under five on the handout. A form of description of events. I just remark in passing by event, she means what I've been calling happenings. I'm going to go on calling them happenings. And if anybody wants to know why, we could talk about that in the discussion. So if a description has this form that she's introducing, then it describes, or at least purports to describe, a happening as intentional on the part of someone, an agent. That's the point of saying um, the term intentional has reference to this form of description of events which she's explaining. The mark of the form is that a description can have in order to, or because, in one sense, this is back to the quotation there under five, attached to it. If you think about it, adding in order to locates a description in Aristotle's version of the order. Adding because, in the right sense, locates a description in Anscombe's version of the order. So she said, um, this is two ways of getting at the same order. Uh, uh, description has the form if it can be placed in that order. And she gives an example, and I find the example very helpful. I slid on the ice because I felt cheerful. If I can say that, then my sliding on the ice has the form that she's explaining. My sliding on the ice describes the sliding as intentional on my part. That's what it is for it to have the form. But not so if the only answer to the question why I slid on the ice is perhaps that I lost my footing. Right? So there's two different. Why, why did you slide on the ice? Because I felt cheerful. That locates my sliding on the ice as a case of the form. Why did you slide on the ice? I slid. Um, that's not responding to the why question that um, singles out intentional actions. The example's helpful, and then she says some quite helpful things, further things, about uh, different kinds of verbs or verb forms that go into descriptions of happenings that are, I'd say, candidates for being happenings of this special kind. Some verbs or verb phrases, uh, for instance, marrying, are unlike sliding on ice in that one can know that a description of a happening has the form just on the basis that one of these verbs or verb forms figure in it. John's marrying Andrea 
Um, that has the form. You can just tell from what marrying means. Others, verbs or verb phrases, uh, for instance, offending, these are examples of hers, are unlike sliding on ice in that their sense depends on their being able to figure in descriptions that have the form. There couldn't be a concept of offending if offending wasn't something you could do intentionally. But they're unlike marrying in that a description of a happening in terms of one of these verbs or verb phrases, say offending, may or may not have the form. That depends on whether it admits of supplementation with in order to or because in the relevant sense. And so why are you offending this person? Uh, in order to get back at her because she offended me. Well, okay, that has my offending then has the form. Why are you offending this person? Good heavens, I didn't know I was. Um, I must go and apologize to her at once. That reveals that the description, my offending that person, doesn't have the form. And now, the, the point of all this, the point of saying the term intentional has reference to a form of description of events, is that it's a way of denying that being intentional is, this is her wording, an extra property. That is, a property possessed by happenings that would be the happenings they are, even if they weren't intentional on the part of the relevant agent. Another way of saying that, to talk about this special form of description of events is a way of insisting that being intentional is intrinsic to the happenings of which it's true. They wouldn't be those happenings if they weren't intentional on the part of the relevant agent. Okay, now, now I go to section six if you're following in the handout. So having put in place this idea of a form of description of events, Anscom makes two remarks as a kind of preliminary uh, to the uh, explanation, the final explanation of how to understand practical knowledge. Uh, the two remarks are uh, Roman 1 and Roman 2 on the handout, and the final explanation is the next thing on the handout. So first remark. A great many descriptions of events affected by human beings are formally descriptions of executed intentions. And the point of the stressed formally there is to say these descriptions, descriptions of events affected by human beings, are descriptions that have the form that she's explained. And then the second preliminary remark, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, if someone intends to be doing something in particular, it's exceptional for there not to be a happening that is that intention getting executed. And then she says, at any rate, if we focus on a man's performances in a man's performance in its more immediate descriptions. A little comment on that second remark. It's exceptional for there not to be a happening that is an intention getting executed if one intends to be doing something. What one's doing intentionally may have the form of a kinesis. That's to say, one will have done what one intends only if one reaches a certain terminus. And it's a familiar fact that one can be, for instance, painting a wall yellow. Painting a wall yellow has the form of a kinesis. Even if one isn't going to finish painting it yellow, a time is not going to come at which one will have painted it yellow. This second remark that Anscombe makes isn't the obviously false claim that failing to bring projects to completion is exceptional. That would be mad. I mean, would that it were so, but it's not obviously not so. What she's saying is it's exceptional if someone intends to be doing something, and now we can say to be painting a wall yellow, for there not to be a happening, for there to be nothing going on, right? for there not to be a happening of the sort required for that intention to be getting executed. In that case, a happening consisting in the walls being in the course of being painted yellow. That's what she's saying is exceptional for there not to be a happening related to the intention like that. Okay, and now she gives the explanation of practical knowledge. At any rate, I think that's what it is. This is the uh, quotation, the long quotation at 
the end of section 6 in the handout. If we put these considerations together, we can say that where A, the description of an event, is of a type to be formally the description of an executed intention, and B, the event is actually the execution of an intention by our criteria, then the account given by Aquinas of the nature of practical knowledge holds. Practical knowledge is, and this is quoting from Aquinas, the cause of what it understands. Unlike speculative knowledge, which is derived from the objects known. This means more than that practical knowledge is observed to be a necessary condition of the production of various results, or that an idea of doing such and such in such and such ways is such a condition. It means that without practical knowledge, what happens does not come under the description, execution of intentions, whose characteristics we've been investigating. Okay, well, as she said in the second of those preliminary remarks, item Roman 2 on this, in this section of the handout, when someone intends to be doing some specific thing, say painting a wall yellow, there usually is a happening that is the execution of that intention, that intention getting executed. The point she made by invoking a distinctive form of description was that the happenings being the execution of that intention is intrinsic to it. That was the way I put it. The happening is something that wouldn't be the happening. It is, were it not, the execution of that intention. And, and that thought can be expressed like this. The happenings being the execution of that intention is the formal cause of the happening. And you see where I'm going with um, the thing that Aquinas says. I need to make one more claim to get to the thing Aquinas says. A happenings being the execution of an intention is the same fact as its being an object for the agent's practical knowledge. That is, it's being available to the agent to be known as being affected by her under the description that gives the content of her intention. So, we can say that being an object for the agent's practical knowledge is intrinsic to the happening. And we can say that by saying it's the formal cause of the happening. And I take that to be the thesis that Anscombe finds in Aquinas. So Aquinas is um, the great Aristotelian. Um, I take him to be um, exploiting the familiar Aristotelian distinction between kinds of or ways in which the idea of the idea that we express in English with the word cause can figure. Cause means formal cause. Practical knowledge is the formal cause of what it knows. Okay, but that's that's the the um, the story about practical knowledge. I'm going to do some kind of mopping up. Uh, uh, subsidiary questions that arise. Uh, I'm on now to section 7. Anscombe endorses the formula from Aquinas in connection with happenings that are intentions getting executed. That's the significance of the two conditions, A and B, in the long passage. We might wonder what we should say about practical knowledge in the kind of case which she said is rare but not non-existent in which someone intends to be doing something, but there's no happening that is the execution of that intention. That is no happening of which the person's knowledge and intention could be the formal cause. When she first reopens the topic of practical knowledge, after the intervening discussion of practical reasoning, she gives us an example of that. Um, her example involves a, a situation in which she's writing the words, I am a fool, on a blackboard with her eyes shut. And this is a peculiar performance. She's doing it to exemplify practical knowledge. She's got her eyes shut, so she's closing out any possibility of contemplative knowledge of a happening. So the idea is she has a knowledge of the happening consisting in the words, I am a fool, being in the course of appearing on the blackboard. Uh, but that knowledge can only be 
practical. She has no contemplative knowledge of it. Uh, she knows it as being affected by her. But then she notes intentions can fail to get executed. So the words might not have been appearing on the blackboard because something might have gone wrong with the chalk or the surface of the blackboard. The surface of the blackboard is wet, unknown to her. The chalk has a bit of grit in it. In that case, if the words are not appearing on, had not been appearing on the blackboard, in that case she would still have had an intention to be writing those words on the blackboard with her eyes shut. But there would have been no happening consisting in that intention getting executed. There would have been happenings consisting in other intentions getting executed. For instance, a happening consisting in her moving the chalk in intermittent contact with the surface of the blackboard in the ways required for writing those words. But there would have been no happening that would include the words appearing on the blackboard. And then in a puzzling remark about this case, this is the case of um, intending to be doing something and there is no happening uh, uh, that, that is the intention getting executed. Puzzling remark about this case that she made. She says, her knowledge would have been the same even if this had happened. The remark's puzzling because it seems right to protest in a way that she immediately acknowledges. Uh, this is all there in the quotation on the handout. If then my knowledge is independent of what actually happens, how can it be knowledge of what does happen? It would have been the same even if the thing hadn't been happening. How could it be knowledge of the happening that there actually is uh, in the case that she presents? Someone might say it was a funny sort of knowledge that was still knowledge, even though what it was knowledge of was not the case. But what can she mean by saying her knowledge would have been the same even if the words hadn't been appearing? In the alternative possible world, in which the words don't appear, her intention to be writing those words on the blackboard with her eyes shut is the same. So, her knowledge is the same insofar as it's the content of her self-consciousness in, as she supposes, executing that intention. But knowledge that one has in as one supposes, executing an intention comes in two forms. In the alternative possible world, her knowledge is essentially a defective form of a kind of thing whose non-defective form is this, having available to one to be known, as one's doing, a happening whose description matches the content of one's intention. That's how it is in the, the actual case in the counterfactual case in which the words aren't showing up. What she has is a defective form of that. Her knowledge in the alternative possible worlds in which the words aren't appearing on the blackboard stands to the knowledge that she attributes to herself in the actual world. Practical knowledge of a happening that includes those words appearing on the blackboard as failure to be doing what one intends to be doing stands to actually doing it. And now, defective forms need to be understood precisely as defective forms of what they are. Uh, uh, defective forms of, right? <laughs> That's how defective forms need to be understood. In the alternative possible world, this is the, 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 the setup, there's no happening that could have as its formal cause the knowledge in intention whose content is given by her intention to be writing those words on the blackboard. Uh, that would have to be a happening, including the words appearing, and there is no such happening. So we have to understand her knowledge and intention in that case, the alternative possible world, as a defective form of what Aquinas says practical knowledge is. And um, where I'm going with that is, um, having made that point, it's good enough to focus on the non-defective forms. Um, we acknowledge that there are defective, defective forms of this kind of thing. Okay, now to uh, uh, item, section 8. Anscombe's example of writing with her eyes shut uh, is paired with a parallel, she means it to be parallel, parallel example of someone directing the building of a house 
without observing or getting reports of what's going on at the site. He's not at the site. He's maybe in telephone. One-way telephone communication with people at the site who are actually sticking bricks on top of each other and so forth. So this director's knowledge of the happenings at the site, again, this is supposed to be the, um, what we say about this case, can only be practical. He knows those happenings as affected by him. He has no contemplative knowledge of them. That's put into the story. No reports, no observation. In both these cases, both that case and the case of writing on the blackboard with her eyes shut, practical knowledge figures as an agent's only knowledge of some happenings. Anscombe's only knowledge of the happening consisting of the words appearing on the blackboard is practical. The builders, the building director's only knowledge of the happenings of the site is practical. But now it's really important that we don't take that as an indication that in Anscombe's view, practical knowledge is in general what it is in those cases, a way of knowing the actuality of the happenings that are its objects. I get this from the um, long passage that's there on the handout under eight. Um, this is something from near the end of her treatment of practical knowledge, where Anscombe goes back to the case of the building director and says, and now I'll read out the quotation, Naturally, my imaginary case in which a man directs operations which he doesn't see and of which he gets no information is a very improbable one, well sure. Normally, someone doing or directing anything makes use of his senses or of reports given him the whole time. He will not go on, the building director, he will not go on to the next order, for example, until he knows that the preceding one has been executed. Or if he's the operator, his senses inform him of what's going on. The second case is the case of oneself making changes in the world. This knowledge is, of course, always speculative as opposed to practical. Thus, in any operation, we really can speak of two knowledges. The account that one could give of what one was doing without adverting to observation and the account of exactly what's happening at a given moment, say, to the material one is working on. The one is practical, the other speculative. So what she's saying there is that normally an agent needs speculative knowledge of happenings that are thereby available to her to know as her doing. Speculative is another way of saying contemplative. She's switched to the term that she got out of Aquinas intelligently because there's been the quotation from Aquinas in the interim. It's only in special cases, um, as maybe when a skilled writer writes short strings of words with her eyes shut, that practical knowledge might be sufficient by itself for knowing the actuality of a happening that its agent can know not contemplatively as effected by in the normal case, you need contemplative knowledge, for instance, observational knowledge, in order to know that the happenings are actual, and then they are available to you to know as you're doing. The doctrine Anscombe finds in Aquinas is that the formal cause of a happening intentionally affected by an agent is <coughs> its being an object for the agent's practical knowledge. Being an object for the agent's practical knowledge that doesn't mean that the agent actually knows it as her doing. She may, but that's not what's required. What it means is, as I've actually occasionally expressed the thought before now, that it's available to her to be known as her doing. She may need observational or otherwise contemplative knowledge of the happening for the potentiality that's implicit in that use of the word available to be actualized. Now, I'm going to talk about a, a familiar case in the philosophy of action that I think exemplifies this point. A uh, case of Donald Davidson's. He imagined someone setting out to make ten copies of a document all at once by interleaving ten sheets of paper with carbon paper and writing firmly on the top sheet. This is an obsolete technology. You have, some people have to have what carbon paper is explained to them. 
to understand this example. It, it, you press hard and it makes an impression on the sheet below it because it's one of one of its sides is um, covered with carbon in some form. So suppose the words are appearing on all the sheets. Um, then in Davidson's example, the person is intentionally making ten copies of them once. But he can't know that he's doing that without looking. That's often thought to be a counterexample to a doctrine of Anscombe's. But it isn't the way I'm reading Anscombe. If the person is getting the words to appear on all the sheets, in writing firmly on the top sheet, he's doing that intentionally. The case meets Anscombe's requirements, uh, set out in the passage that I quoted under three on the handout. Anscombe's requirements for a phrase of the form doing Z in doing ABC to describe an intentional action. He's got an opinion that if he does ABC, that is, presses really hard on the top sheet, having done put all this into leaving, then um, it can happen that the words show up on the bottom sheet. So it meets that requirement if the opinion turns out to be correct, as she says. But contrary to the idea that the example tells against Anscombe, the happening that consists in the words appearing on all the sheets is an object of the agent's practical knowledge in the only sense that Anscombe needs. It's available to the agent to be known as his doing. When he finds out by looking that there has been such a happening, it has to go retrospective. He knows, not contemplatively, that it has been intentionally affected by him. Anscombe's list of ways of rejecting the question why begins with saying, I was not aware that I was doing that. That's the first way to reject the question. And that's sometimes thought to imply the doctrine that Davidson offers his case as a counterexample to, the doctrine that someone can't be doing something intentionally unless she knows she's doing it. I was not aware I was doing that as a rejection of the question. Davidson, a, a, Davidson's agent needs to check whether the requisite things are happening by observation or other contemplative ways of knowing, get somebody else to look, whatever, but um, needs to check <laughs> contemplatively before he can know that he's writing on all the sheets at once. But if he hasn't checked and so doesn't know that the words are appearing on all the sheets, he won't invoke that ignorance to reject the question, why? This isn't a case of that first way of rejecting the question, why? Why are you writing on all the sheets? He won't say, oh, I didn't know I was. Uh, he'll, he'll answer the question. He'll give his reasons. Um, maybe prefacing it by saying, aha, so I am bringing it off. Well, here's why. So his ignorance, until he dissolves this ignorance, doesn't disqualify making ten copies all at once from being a description of an executed intention by Anscombe's lights. So it's not a counterexample. Where this is going, practical knowledge is knowledge concerning a happening whose actuality one may need to know contemplatively, if it's to figure in one's knowledge at all, that it's one's intention getting executed. Even if one knows only contemplatively that some relevant thing is happening, one's knowledge concerning that happening, that it's one's intention getting executed, that is not contemplative. That's an instance of the self-knowledge of an agent. Okay, you can tell from the handout that near the end, I'm now at section 9. So I've begun, and especially in that last sentence, to frame practical knowledge as a species of self-consciousness, as my title promises. And as I said at the beginning, I think putting Anscombe's doctrine in that context helps us to make sense of it. A um, kind of preliminary point for getting there. Uh, the idea of knowledge that's the formal cause of its object, right? so, so knowledge that's such that its object wouldn't be what it is, uh, were it not available to be known in this way, that idea, knowledge that's the formal cause of its object, that's not special to practical knowledge. That idea fits all varieties of self-knowledge. 
in a certain sense. Uh, Self-knowledge in the sense of knowledge expressible in the first person, not mediated by an identification of oneself with an item about which one knows the relevant thing, not first personally. Example, my knowledge that I have an ache in my knee. That's self-knowledge in the relevant sense. My knowledge that I have an ache in my knee isn't mediated by knowledge that a certain person has an ache in his knee, plus knowledge that I am that person. In contrast, my knowledge of how much I weigh isn't self-knowledge in the relevant sense, even though I express it in the first person. I weigh so many kilos. Because it's mediated by my knowing how much the person who was standing on a certain scale weighed, plus knowing that I was that person. So self-knowledge in the relevant sense is immediate self-knowledge. Uh, self-knowledge not mediated by knowledge that someone is thus and so, plus I am that someone. Now, we can say about um, the, the case I might use to exemplify self-knowledge in the relevant sense, um, uh, we, can, we can bring the idea of formal cause into play. My self-consciousness in feeling an ache in my knee is intrinsic to the state of consciousness that my feeling the ache is. And now moving to another case. My self-consciousness in believing something is intrinsic to the believing. Sebastian Rodel, in his book Self-Consciousness, says that in self-consciousness, in all its varieties, knowing and what is known are the same reality. That's his phrase. And we can express Rodel's thought, and I think this is a sort of easier to grasp way of expressing it, by saying that the knowledge in a case of self-consciousness is the formal cause of its object. It's intrinsic to its object. Its object wouldn't be what it is if it were not available to be known in that way. Now this may seem to wreck everything. I mean, it may, it may seem surprising that, as I'm saying, the idea of knowledge that's the formal cause of its object isn't restricted even to self-consciousness in acts of reason because it extends to self-consciousness in feeling pains and the like, let alone to self-consciousness in acts of practical reason, that is, intentional actions. So shouldn't the formula from Aquinas specify what's practical about practical knowledge? And the answer is no. That's not its job. Practical knowledge is practical, not by virtue of being the formal cause of its objects. That's something it shares with all varieties of self-consciousness. But by virtue of the form of the descriptions under which its objects are known in self-consciousness. The form, that is, that Anscombe explains, in effect, as the form that belongs to descriptions of conclusions of practical reasoning. We don't need to consider self-consciousness in things like bodily feelings. I mean, that's a case, knowledge the formal cause, but we don't need to bother with it. Think about self-consciousness in an act of reason. Self-consciousness in an act of reason, whether the reason is theoretical or practical, is consciousness of its object as the act of reason it is. And descriptions of theoretical and practical acts of reason, that is, the descriptions under which they're available to be known in the self-consciousness of their subjects, differ in form, according to the form of the reasoning of which the acts they describe are such as to be conclusions. Or what comes to the same thing, the form of the explanations that make those acts intelligible as the acts of reason they are. I was wording things quite carefully there. I said the reasoning of which the acts they describe are such as to be conclusions. I'm not implying that any act of reason is a conclusion of some reasoning. Remember how Anscombe says the interest of Aristotle's account of practical reasoning doesn't require the absurd idea that there's always reasoning whenever there's intentional action. The point's this. A description that represents an act as an act of, say, practical reason 
has a form by virtue of which it represents what it describes as an act of a kind that's instantiated by conclusions of practical reasoning. And that's just how Anscombe, in effect, explains the form of description under which objects of practical knowledge are known. So self-consciousness in general is the formal cause of what it knows, but practical knowledge, that is self-consciousness in acting, is distinctively practical self-consciousness. It's the self-consciousness of someone who's effecting a happening that's describable in the form that Anscombe explains in terms of the form of practical reasoning. Thank you for listening. Thank you.